If you've been working in the hygiene industry for a while, you can't help but have noticed how the industry has changed. In most cases, I think we can agree that these changes have been for the good. Changes like market growth, an increase in choice for the consumer, and improved products driven by innovation in design, materials, and processes have all helped to advance the industry. New entrants in the market, from an increase in private labels and retailer-owned brands, to companies endorsed or sometimes started by celebrities and influencers, have challenged major producers. All the while, producers new and old had to be concerned with the performance of their products, how comfortable they were for consumers, their odor, and of course, how much they cost. Many of these changes bring challenges for producers and suppliers, those with years of experience and expertise, and those new to the industry alike. In just the last year or so, consumer awareness about what is in their products was becoming a big focus. On top of that, the demand for sustainable products has grown and will only increase as end users become more conscious of the sources of their products and just how many diapers, pads, and tampons are ending up in landfills all over the world. And then, in early 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic started to spread across the globe and disposable hygiene producers had a whole new set of problems to worry about, like meeting demand as panic buying started, sourcing raw materials that were in higher demand due to an increase in mask production, keeping line operators safe so their plants could remain open and they could continue producing products, transitioning non-plant employees to working from home and keeping them engaged, and a whole lot more. The disposable hygiene industry has changed a lot in the last 24 months alone, not least due to the impact of the global COVID-19 pandemic. With the pandemic having spread across the globe, we are faced with having to deal with situations never seen at a global scale before. With all of these changes, we have had to turn to new ways of communicating and sharing information to keep people engaged, informed, and up to speed on challenges and how to meet them, while still meeting our respective business goals. Luckily, Bostic is here to help. Welcome to the Attached to Hygiene podcast. I'm your host, Jack Hughes. On every episode of Attached to Hygiene, Bostic and other industry experts provide valuable insight into market and consumer trends in the disposable hygiene industry and how article producers can increase their success and reach their business goals. On today's episode, we're going to introduce you to where the disposable hygiene industry stands from our point of view. From the size of the market and where it is expected to grow, to the major market segments, and changing consumer demands and expectations, we want to give you a detailed overview of this important global industry. Here to help me walk you through the state of the industry is Bostic's global marketing manager, Paul Andrews. Paul, you've been in the industry for decades in a number of different roles. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your background and why you find the industry so interesting? Hello, Jack. Uh, thanks for asking me to join you uh, today. Uh, yes, so my, my background. While preparing for this podcast, I actually realized I've been in the, the adhesive industry for 25 years this year. Uh, so I joined the adhesive industry selling adhesives into mainly industrial applications, graphics and packaging in 1997. Um, but I've actually been in the, the hygiene or operating in the hygiene market uh, only since 2002 when I first joined Bostic. So I started uh, with commercial responsibility for a large article producer, and then started working with producers in the Middle East and the Africa region, um, trying to understand what, what opportunities there were for, uh, for Bostic in the hygiene market in those emerging geographies. I then joined our strategic marketing group around 10 years ago, maybe a little bit longer now, I, I can't actually remember, with a, a regional market responsibility before ending up in the position I am today. So you asked me why I find the, the industry so interesting. And, and I think listening to your introduction, you hit on quite a few of the, the, the reasons there. Even forgetting, and I wish we could forget quite a lot of it actually, the, the many challenges of the last 12 months, it is constantly changing. It's a constantly changing market. In many cases, I think the changes are to the benefit of the consumer and the industry in general. Many of these changes impact us as suppliers and that considering we're in a, a, a B2B industry, we are really impacted by changing consumer needs, the their changes in expectations and their, their habits, and really what they're looking for and how they use their products. But of course, that brings challenges as well. And uh, we've been part of some really quite large market growth over the, over the years. 
We've seen the emergence of uh, private label and then retail owned brands. And then more recently, increasing competition, consolidation. You know, we've explored and entered new geographies, seen and participated in many new product innovations and designs. So life is, has never really been dull, has it? No, it hasn't. Uh, I, can, I can speak from experience that you know our job is certainly never boring. So yeah, thank you for for sharing uh, your your a little bit of your background and your interest in the industry, and and we'll go ahead and dive into our discussion today on on where the market stands. First, where does the market stand today in regards to size and potential growth? Well, I hope our audience likes data because we do have a lot of data, mainly coming from from Euromonitor. But we, we look at that uh, market data and we see that the global market is somewhere in the region of 490 billion units per year. And it comes as no surprise that when we look at the market, we consider three main areas. So that's baby, femcare and adult incontinence. Now, globally, the femcare market is the largest um, with something like 275 billion units per year. So close to 60% of the global market for hygiene is, is in Femcare. Uh, baby care makes up around 35% of the rest of that market. So 170 billion units-ish. And then adult care is the smallest, the smallest part of that market with something like 50, 50 billion units per year. Now we can look at it by region as well. And, and China is today the largest market for absorbent hygiene products. And China alone represents 32% of the, of the global market. Now, of course, the regional market sizes do vary within each category. China is still the largest market for femcare and also baby care, but the adult market is still relatively small there when compared to the more mature regions of North America, Europe, and Japan. Now, I mentioned growth earlier on, um, but if you're looking for specific numbers, uh, you see that the uh, the global market is these days growing at somewhere between three and four percent a year, which is I I believe considerably uh, smaller growth growth than we have seen during my time at, at Bostic. Like market sizes, growth rates do vary considerably from one region to another, and also within those three categories of product. So where is growth coming from primarily? You may ask. So if you look at baby care. The baby care market is predicted to grow by around 20% over the next five years. But that 20% includes a reduction in the market size in Japan and pretty much no growth at all in North America and Europe. Now, it's a similar story in, in feminine care, but the growth rate is, uh, is in the mid-teens. The greatest growth rates, albeit from a much smaller baseline, are forecast in the, uh, the adult incontinence market. But I'm, I, if, if companies are looking for growth, I'm not sure that they can rely solely on, on the adult incontinence market to, to achieve their short to medium goals. But there are a number of pockets of higher market growth across various regions. But even if you take into, those, into account those growth rates, let's say in, you know, in India, in, in uh, parts of the Middle East, in, in Africa, people are going to need to rely on taking market share from their competition in order to reach their growth goals. And this is one of the challenges faced by article producers but also the suppliers of materials. And those large variances do pose challenges for the article manufacturers and their suppliers when it comes to understanding where to invest, where to look for their growth, and also how to grow. And I know we're going to look at consumer needs a, a bit later. And because there are some clear global trends and how far they're advanced and what that actually means in terms of product design or how you meet the consumer need does vary from one region to another. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's no secret that, you know, as you mentioned, that, that these producers are, are facing a ton of challenges, um, just as, just as uh, the suppliers of those producers like Bostic are facing yep. challenges and, and trying to meet those needs of a wide variety of consumers across all these different regions. And not only do, do these producers, uh, you know, the, the big players and the, and the small ones alike have to reach an audience of parents for baby diaper and pull-up type products, but also women between the ages of 12 and 50, which is a very diverse market in and of itself, and also pretty much any adult who may experience incontinence. Yep. So can you talk a little bit about the needs of those different groups? Yes, I, th I think so. But one, one fundamental thing we have to remember is whatever is going on with, you know, with the choices of materials, whether you know, the article producer is keeping an eye on odor, whether they're focusing on sustainability, the product has to work. Or in other words, it doesn't leak. 
So we have to bear that in mind as the, as the basic need at all times. And you can add as many bells and whistles to a product. It can be the softest product in the market. It can be the most natural product. But if the product leaks or doesn't work, in inverted commas, the consumer just isn't going to be satisfied. Now, some listeners to our podcast may have been present at some of our webinars that we've given over the last year. And we, in our market trends and dynamics presentations, we usually show a word cloud that incorporates many needs. Needs such as lower odor, softness, discretion, skin kindness, sustainability, transparency. The list is, is, is really quite huge. But if you, if you look at baby care, and again, fundamental need, the product mustn't leak but it has to be kind to the baby's skin, be comfortable for the baby, considered by the parent or carer as safe for use. Now in femcare, again, the product needs to work. It needs to absorb what is ever put in it and not leak. But once you get into femcare, this is where we start to see slight different needs, particularly in the area of discretion. And also if you consider femcare and also some light incontinence products, these are the products that are bought by the consumer themselves. The person that is actually going to be using the product is normally the person that buys them. So the needs start to change a little bit. So if we go back to femcare and we also start to consider light incontinence, the product needs to be consistent in the way it works as a pad is intended to temporarily bond to underwear and work in whatever design of underwear the wearer chooses and regardless of the fabric that it's made of. It also needs to work whatever the wearer is doing and wherever they are, geographically, in their time of life, and, and whether they're at work or at home, the product has to, to work. So there are quite a lot of demands on that product. It's a tough challenge for the producer and the femcare consumer is historically probably the most loyal consumer and in the past has been most reluctant to change product or brand once they find a product that works for them. Yeah, I would think with all the new options in femcare products out there that con that consumer loyalty you mentioned is, is really being challenged and is a, a challenge uh, for those major femcare producers. Uh, but do you see the same needs and loyalty when it comes to adult Inco products? Interesting, Jack, you should mention new options in femcare. Over, over the, the recent years, we've discussed quite a bit in our conversations with customers and with people in the industry about what's happening in femcare designs and We've seen that um, a number of alternatives uh, to a typical hygiene product have become more available, such as menstrual cups. Now, even though they've become more widely available across the globe, and even promoted as a better option in some emerging geographies, such as in Africa, we see growth in designs and traditional product features. Now, we often undertake market research, and what became clear in some work we were doing particularly in the Russian market, was that um, younger feminine care consumers are more open to try new things. Now, in years gone by, they may use the products used by their older siblings, um, mothers, or in some cases, even grandmothers, and take advice from them. Now, these days, with the topic and products being shared more in, in media, on social media platforms, advice is being taken from other areas, and the younger consumer may, may be actually more experimental. Now, in Femcare, we see more startup companies with products directly positioned at this younger, often more environmentally aware consumer. So producers are looking to innovate with the design and look of the product, even as far as, as changing packaging and making the packaging more attractive and um, differentiating with the look and feel and the way the product is presented. They also try to reach the consumer more directly right, rather than relying on this loyalty that I just mentioned or the consumer being happy to use the same product as the older members of their families. You know, consumer choice in femcare particularly may be driven by factors other than just product performance. Yes, again, it needs to work, but we see you know, growth in organic and natural products driven by generations interest in the topic, as well as seeing you know, new designs in you know, reusable femcare products such as feminine care underwear. But yes, you asked me about adult. Um, so yes, in the adult incontinence market, discretion is still very important, obviously. You know, for the light inco product user, the, the basic needs are probably similar to, to femcare. For the, adult care, for the adult diaper wearer, again, discretion is important, but you start to see some needs that we spoke about in baby care, such as you know, being kind to skin, comfort, and softness. Then of the adult market, it probably won't come as any surprise again that the market can be split into three main areas, depending on the type of user and product type. Now we have light inco, which we already mentioned. And then we have the institutional user who is typically a resident in a care home or a hospital and is more likely to have their product selected for them 
as well as at least partially funded for them. Now here the product cost is a, is a greater factor for the decision maker to take into account. And then lastly, there's the medium or heavy inco product pant or diaper user. And these people will probably source, in some cases, the product themselves from the lo local supermarket. So again, discretion becomes more important. And I think as we, as we record and uh, release more podcasts, we'll talk and do a deeper dive into each of these market segments in much more detail. Yeah, we definitely will. And I'm, I'm looking forward to those episodes as we've got some you know, great guests and experts lined up. Now, you, you touched uh, in your discussion on, on feminine care and, and on AI in the, in the dif different demographics. But uh, can you briefly touch on the role culture plays in uh, mm -hmm. and, and even age demographics play on mm -hmm. consumer needs? Yeah. So, yes, in all of these areas that we've spoken about, we have to consider the culture of the consumer. And how they prefer their needs to be met does vary based on you know, history, geography, age, and how they are influenced. You know, I, I, I spoke quite a bit about you know, feminine care and what we see as, as um, you know, loyalty perhaps being challenged in some way by the culture or the age of the, of the current users. Now, while increased adult incontinent usage in mature markets is a result of ageing, Meeting the needs of, the, of the, the other generations, the millennials, for example, is a significant interest and importance for ongoing business success. Now, these, this generation in particular, the millennials, they are sceptical of bigger brands. Um, they, don't, they don't assume product safety. They particularly want to know what's in their product. They do a lot of research and they buy online. And they may look to e-commerce or subscriptions um, to replenish stocks of, of product. They're less likely to trust big companies. They're less likely to trust advertising. They will use social media. They, they will listen to um, the crowd. They look for companies and they want to buy from companies that are giving something back. So companies that have clear corporate social responsibility strategies and policies, they will be of greater interest to, to this consumer. They also want products, I believe, that are, are, are more customizable or actually believed to be for them. So something that these may be fashionable or something which they can actually have a say in, in, in the design or the pattern, something which is um, they believe is more suited to them. And they look for value. So they are less likely to go straight to the premium brands. They will compare prices and they will look for value. Yeah, absolutely. As, as someone who falls into that millennial age range, um, I can certainly agree. I'm skeptical of big brands. I don't always assume a product is safe or good for the environment. Uh, I'm doing a lot of research online. Uh, I certainly would trust uh, my peers over big company advertising or advertising in general. I certainly value companies that are giving back and um, I'm definitely looking for comparing prices and, and the, the best value for my money. And yeah, that means that there are certainly a ton of things that these producers have to keep in mind in order to target and try to win over uh, the millennial and Gen Z population groups. Um, and you mentioned consumer needs in one of your earlier comments. In, in your view, uh, there, there, I know there are five major needs that are driving trends mm -hmm. across the major markets. Can you tell us more about those five needs? Yeah, so you mentioned the five, the five needs and... When I go back to the word cloud that I mentioned earlier with this, this, this huge number of trends or, or needs, we believe we can put each of those into one or more buckets. And the buckets we use are comfort, confidence, convenience, consistency, and cost. Now, if we look at comfort, for example, the things that we would consider as being trends related to those needs, I mean, we've seen a growth in disposable pant, pant diapers. I mean, they, they we believe they are probably more comfortable for the baby. They, they move with the baby and, and also the adult. We see an increase in softer materials, the use of softer materials to, to give that feeling of comfort and softness against the skin. We see um, an evolution in core designs. I mean, core has been a huge topic for us as we look to understand um, the adhesive requirements of the different core designs that are being used by the article producers today and, and in the future. Confidence was the second one I mentioned, and you know, consumers need to be confident that the product is going to work. And I keep coming back to the fact that the, the, the product needs to work, but it needs to work consistently. Whatever product they are using, 
the product performance needs to be consistent so the the consumer is confident that it's going to work wherever they are in whatever circumstance it needs to work needs to work in they need to be confident that the product is discreet particularly again in the area of adult incontinence and feminine hygiene that we spoke about earlier and they need to have the confidence that the product is produced in a responsible way and is is safe is safe is safe to be worn and if we look at uh, convenience there are i think there are there are four you know, four good examples here of, of the need for convenience. And the first one is obviously getting hold of the product. And if you look at some emerging geographies, it's important that it's convenient to get hold of the product. So it needs to be available where the consumer is. And then if you look to the design of the product, it's important that it's easy to put on and easy to remove, which is also why I think we've seen the attraction of, of pants in the market. It needs to be safe and easy and discreet to remove and, and dispose of it without without worry um, need to be able to, to uh, dispose of the product conveniently and there's some other things that you, you might want to put into the bucket of convenience things like indicators and sensors you know we've we've been a producer of hot melt wetness indicators for for many years and they really do offer an aspect of convenience to the to the user of a of a product that contains a you know, an indicator and then more recently, we've seen growth in the use of what gets called wearable technology. So sensors to help help the, um, the carer or the user of a product know when the product needs to be changed. Or in some cases, even identify um, ailments uh, through the use of a product. And moving on to, uh, to consistency. I mentioned consistency quite a bit under under confidence, but again, I mean, consistency. We mentioned this a little bit in in femcare, but consistency gives consumers peace of mind. And if the product's consistent and it meets their needs all of the time, they're going to become loyal loyal consumers. So the product needs to fit. It needs to to work, of course, consist consistently. It needs to be uh, its performance needs to be predictable. Um, so it's an important an important. Uh, trend really an important set of needs cost yeah you can't you can't talk about trends and needs without taking into account cost and that's in two areas so cost for the article producer to produce their product and that's not just about the, the you know the price of the material that they're buying it's it's how much they they get out of the use of that product in terms of ad adhesive we talk about adhesive add-on as one area of cost to to consider and if you look at the consumer Cost is reflected in the price they pay for the product or the value of that product that we spoke about when we were talking about um, the culture. Now, we have some great examples of how article producers are working to meet these needs and the trends that we see both globally and, and regionally. And I have to mention that adhesives do play a very important and in some cases absolutely essential or exclusive role in, in the ability for the, for the article producer to include features, certain features in the hygiene product. Now, I know we're going to discuss each of these five C's as we describe them and how they are driven by culture in upcoming episodes of, of Attached to Hygiene. Yeah, yeah, you, you know, we'll definitely be touching on those five C's and, and a lot more. You know, you, you touched on a lot just in that short, you know, 20, 25 minutes or so. And, um, you know, I'm really looking forward to diving deeper into some of these topics in our future episodes uh, with you and some other Bostic experts and uh, even some people outside of Bostic from the industry at large. So, Paul, thank you so much for joining our first episode. It's been great to chat with you. My pleasure. Thank you, Jack. So as you heard from Paul, we've got a ton of great episodes in the pipeline coming in the next few months. We'll have experts from Bostic and other major industry players joining us to share insights on their different areas of expertise, and we're excited to bring it to you every two weeks. Attached to Hygiene is brought to you by Bostic and is hosted by me, Jack Hughes. It is produced and edited by me with the help of Michelle Tonkovitz and Green Onion Creative. Our theme music is by Jonathan Boyle. You can follow Bostic for more hygiene industry insights on LinkedIn at Disposable Hygiene Adhesives or email us with questions or comments at hygiene at bostic.com. That's H-Y-G-I-E-N-E -E at bostic.com. We'd also like to extend a special thank you to our first guest, Paul Andrews. Paul isn't on social media, but you're more than welcome to direct any emails to him at the hygiene at bostic.com email address I just mentioned. If you like what you heard on this episode, you can subscribe to Attached to Hygiene wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time.